Good morning. A little more, please. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Listen, it's the sun shining in Seattle. How bad can it be? It is wonderful to have all of you here. Thank you for your patience. As you can imagine, if you've been following what's going on in the news, it is uh, quite a busy day for those who are focused upon and concerned about anti-Semitism in our country. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is the case. Um, if, if you don't know, the, uh, the White House finally released its uh, strategic paper and program on anti-Semitism literally within the last two hours or so. Um, I like to say this has happened to me before. Uh, serendipity and timing makes me appear much more prophetic and much more brilliant than I truly am, but sometimes timing is everything. But it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome all of you to, and it's hard to believe, the 42nd annual Clergy Institute, now Clergy Institute for Interfaith Learning. Give yourselves a hand for that. How many of you have been to one of these before in the past? Oh, so many of you. It's wonderful to have repeat customers. And for those of you for whom this is the first time, we hope it, uh, it won't be the last time. Uh, and it's an annual event that has solidified interreligious bonds for at least two generations, building on the pioneering roles with which Father Hunthausen from Seattle University and Rabbi Levine here at Temple led this community. There are many people to thank. I just want to go through this because it's very, very important. Thanks to Seattle University and the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement, the Alfred and Tilly Shemansky Trust, Ted and Kellen Eisenhart, children of Henry and Mila Eisenhart, whose vision helped to really establish this event at the beginning, and of course, to the Anti-Defamation League and Mary Cypers, the executive director here in the Pacific Northwest for wonderful partnership in making this happen amongst all the things that our esteemed guest is doing in his West Coast jaunt. Um, some very specific thank yous to Michael Reed Trice, uh, the Spihar Halligan Professor and Director at the Seattle University Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement, and also from our partners at Seattle University. Uh, many thanks to Catherine Puncelan Manlimos uh, from the, um, what office is it? Please forgive me, uh, Michael, what is it? From the, <laughs> that I couldn't remember. It sounded more complicated when you shared it with me before. Thank you. The office of the president, of course. And of course, to John Orlando from the provost's office at Seattle University. Thank you so much. Um, and again, profoundly grateful uh, for Seattle University's commitment as a university that is focused upon academic freedom and by consequence to the free expression of ideas which cultivate the necessary exchanges in our shared commons that are essential to a healthy and thriving democracy today. Some in-house thanks to Rabbi Kate Spizer, Jesse Cunningham on our staff, Cornell Farrell, Temple Services staff, and members of our administrative team who made this event actually happen every single year, but particularly this year, when we have so much else, we had a big annual meeting last night, we have our confirmation ceremony tonight, and so amongst all the things that's happening, that are happening in the congregation, we are so deeply grateful for put it, focusing upon this at a, uh, in a very busy moment. So thank you, please give them all. All right, and now for the main event, well, First of all, let me take a step back and tell you a little bit about the morning. We're gonna have this keynote conversation. There'll be some curated questions based on cards that hopefully you'll be getting and we'll be able to fill out so that we can kind of consolidate questions because oftentimes people ask some of the same questions. We will get together to break bread over lunch, which is always a critical part of this experience. Breaking bread, having the opportunity to dialogue about what we've discussed this morning is an important element of this. And then after about an hour or so, we will wrap up with some additional questions to our keynote presenter here this morning. Jonathan Greenblatt is CEO of ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, the world's leading anti-hate organization with a distinguished record of fighting anti-Semitism and advocating for just and fair treatment to all. Jonathan joined ADL in 2015 after serving in the White House as Special Assistant to President Obama and Director of the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. He joined the government after a distinguished career in business as a successful social entrepreneur, 
and corporate executive. He co-founded Ethos Brands, the company that launched Ethos Water, which was acquired by Starbucks in 20, 2005. Found it all for good, acquired by Points of Light 2011. A lot of good acquisitions now. That's, and served a senior executive at Realtor.com, which was acquired by News Corp in 2014. Since becoming CEO, Jonathan has modernized ADL while refocusing it on the mission it has had since its founding in 1913 to fight the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair, fair treatment to all. Jonathan recently published his first book, which will be on sale out there, and I'm sure he will inscribe it for those who want. It could happen here, why America is tipping from hate to the unthinkable and how we can stop it. A bracing primer on how we as individuals, as organizations, and as a society can strike back against anti-Semitism and hate. It is again with a great deal of honor and pleasure that I share with you this morning for our 42nd Annual Clergy Institute for Interfaith Learning, Jonathan Greenblatt. So it's always wonderful to hear your eulogy while you're living, right? It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, what a, I would just say right off the bat, like what a blessing it is to be here and what a marvelous legacy, 42 years of this program. Yasher Koch, I think that's really pretty phenomenal. No, thank you. It's, um, my, uh, my predecessors here in, uh, in Seattle really in many ways pioneered interfaith and interreligious uh, uh, dialogue and, 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 and partnership well before it was trendy to do so. Actually, what sparked uh, my predecessor, Rabbi Levine, and uh, Father Tracy, his partner from the Catholic Archdiocese, was not Vatican II, it was before that. It was the Kennedy uh, presidential election. Wow. So really, prior to it becoming a trendy thing after Vatican II, um, Seattle had some incredible interfaith pioneers um, to lay the groundwork for this kind of experience. Well, I'll tell you, you know, when I worked for Starbucks, I had the privilege of, of living here. I was commuting between LA and Seattle, but I had a place in Belltown. And so I feel a very special relationship to this city and to this community. And it's not lost on me that this is just one of the most progressive, one of the most diverse, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the country. So I didn't know about the program beforehand, but I'm entirely you know, unsurprised to hear no, about thank it. Thank you, thank you very much. And you are a wonderful addition to our, to our legacy here. So let's start out a bit on a personal note. Please uh, share a bit about your, your upbringing sure. and your personal evolution in that your path toward becoming ADL director is relatively unconventional. From yeah. Politics to the for-profit world and everything in between. How did you get here? Well, so I'm originally from Connecticut. Uh, I was born in New Haven and raised in a little town called Trumbull, which is not a very uh, exciting place. Um, but, and you know, I grew up in a conservative Jewish home. Um, but anti-Semitism was always sort of in the background. So my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor from Germany mm. who wouldn't talk about it, like a lot of survivors, um, to, to be specific. He escaped Germany in the late 30s. He escaped the ghetto. So, uh, and he was from a town called Magdeburg and then lived in a place called Danzig. Mm. So after the anti-Semitism became so intense in Germany proper, he moved to a city that's now called Gdansk in Poland, Poland. that was the free city of Danzig. And after the First World War, it was this German enclave in what essentially became Poland. And uh, he moved there, and then when the Nazis you know, invaded Poland, everything fell apart. So, and they reclaimed the city, and my grandfather fled. Now he lost everything, family, friends, he came to this country with no language, no assets, you know, no connections, like so many people. But he carved out sort of a middle class existence in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mm. Um, but it was always there. So. Interestingly enough, when I was a young kid, like eight, seven, eight years old, my grandfather had me and my brother and my cousins marching down Park Avenue in Bridgeport to free the Soviet Jews. Hmm. So I'm sure many people in this sanctuary today were involved in that movement or remember that movement. But those who may be a bit younger and don't, you know, the Soviet Union was, let's just say, not very nice to its Jews. 
and among other things, wouldn't let them leave. And so there was a worldwide movement to free these people, let my people go. And uh, we marched, I marched. And then something amazing happened. They were freed, literally. Now, I don't think as a seven or eight year old, I believe that I was the reason why it happened, but it, but it, it did leave a mark on me that I could be a part of something bigger than myself. I could change the world. Years later, when I was in college, a lot of my friends, and I was getting ready to graduate from Tufts University outside of Boston, they were going to grad school, they were going to consulting jobs or Wall Street. I still wanted to change the world. And it was uh, the spring of 1992, and there was this guy running for president, Bill Clinton. And he really appealed to me. One of the big reasons why he appealed to me, there were a couple reasons. My dad was always self-employed, and healthcare was always a problem in our family. He talked about healthcare for everyone. And uh, I was a work-study student. And Bill Clinton had this idea of young people serving in their communities after college to pay their loans. And I thought, wow, that's a much better way to pay for school than when I was like bussing tables and washing dishes, you know, 30 hours a week or something like that. Is that like a national service program? That's, that? yeah, yeah. yeah. So he then created something called AmeriCorps. Yeah. And the reason why we have national service today as we do is because of Bill Clinton. Yeah. So I went and moved to Arkansas after I graduated and worked <laughs> for Governor Clinton. And then something amazing happened. He also won. Uh, I think this is a case of correlation, not causation. I was going to say, you're the common denominator. Role. Clearly, you're the common denominator, yes. But I will say that like, it left on me this mark that I could also be a part of something bigger than me. I could change the world. That was a pretty exciting kind of realization. And so that has been the true north through my whole career. So we ended up, I ended up going to Washington. I worked in the White House. I did applied macroeconomics for a few years. I ended up getting an MBA out at Northwestern. That I went to California because I saw the internet changing the world and mm. I want to be a part of that revolution. And I was able to do that at a company called Realtor.com that worked out. And then I got bored and I felt like we were a public company, but I was no longer changing the world. And I left that and with my roommate from business school, we started this company, Ethos Water. Mm. That was also about changing the world. And then that worked out. And um, to kind of shorten the story, I've always wanted to change the world, and that's always been the way that I've tried to direct my career. Not where I could make the most money, not where I could get, have the most comfort, not where I could learn the most. I've always said I want to change the world. And it's been like a very useful heading on my personal compass. So flash forward to 2014, I got a call from a headhunter. I used to get lots of calls when I was at the White House public facing job, I'd been a CEO, and the voicemail said, they're looking for a new head of ADL, would you be interested? So I called my wife, and I said, I got the craziest voicemail. <laughs> they're looking for a new person on ADL, and they called me, isn't that ridiculous? And my wife was, her first reaction was, oh, that's a great job. <laughs> really? <laughs> And I was like, oh, it's a terrible job. <laughs> you have to deal with Nazis and anti-Semites and racism. Like and also to follow someone like Abe Foxman, who was such an iconic figure well, in American it's, Judaism. It's interesting you should say that. So full disclosure, right, I am Jewish, and Judaism is a big part of my life. I, I keep a kosher home. I go to synagogue on Saturdays. I'll celebrate Shavuos tonight, tomorrow. But you know what, like, that's what I do in my private life. It was never part of my public life. And I was never involved in the Jewish community. I wasn't involved in Hillel when I was a student in college. Um, I didn't do those things. So I certainly knew the name Abe Fox, but I never met this guy before. I, I wouldn't have recognized him if we were riding together in an elevator, elevator at the top of the Space Needle. I wouldn't have known who the guy was. But I did know ADL. Now, I knew ADL for two reasons. Number one, when I was a student in college, I interned at the ADL office in mm. Boston, Massachusetts. Now, I'll be very honest with you in this intimate setting. Like, my internship at ADL wasn't exactly me, you know, writing amicus briefs to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I was making photocopies and getting people sandwiches <laughs> and doing clips, like cutting things out of newspapers. 
But for a kid at 19, whatever, it was very interesting experience. And then years later, when I moved to Los Angeles, I didn't know anyone, but I used to keep in touch with one of the women I interned for. She had actually, I think, Mira, you know this story, right? Yeah. So this woman I interned for got married, moved to ADL Los Angeles, had a family. So when I moved there, I called her. I said, I don't know anyone. So she was a Jewish mother. So what does a Jewish mother want to do? Take a guess. Find you a nice Jewish girl. Find me a nice Jewish girl. What's the other thing a Jewish mother wants to do? Feed you. Feed you. So I called her. She said, oh, you have to come eat. You have to come for Shabbos dinner. Okay, do that. So I came over for dinner, and then, like, as I was walking through the front door, I hadn't even sat down. She's like, so you're dating anyone? And I said, look, I'm actually too busy. My company's going to go public. I don't have time. And she said, you're not so busy. You should meet this girl. <laughs> she introduced me to a young woman who worked at the ADL office in Los Angeles, and 22 years later, we're still married. So, yeah, it's a very nice story. <laughs> so my wife worked at ADL for about eight years. So I'd never made Abe, Fo Abe Fox, and I knew, I knew the name, but um, what was more important to me was I really knew what ADL was. I knew its commitment to fighting anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. I knew the impact it had on people's lives. And anti-Semitism, you know, my grandfather, as I said, survivor, my wife is an Iranian Jew mm. who's, who came to the United States when she was 17 whose family lived there for a long time until the Islamic Revolution and everything went south and she came here in 87, 88. So, you know, anti-Semitism helped to shape my life in kind of, you know, in, in interesting ways. So I wasn't sure that I was qualified for this job. It wasn't the job that I was looking for, but it feels besher that I'm in the role today. Oh, absolutely, that's an incredible story including reminding people that if uh, our children work in Jewish organizations, maybe they'll find their bichette there. So. <laughs> um, so talking a little bit about your new book, uh, It Could Happen Here, yeah. Why America is Tipping from Hate to the Unthinkable and How We Can Stop It, which is kind of an interesting riff on Sinclair Lewis's yes. It Can't Happen Here. Yes. It's a great title, and I'm sure it will heighten a lot of interest. Um, but it, the question I have is, are things actually as uniquely threatening as this title contends? Or are we simply experiencing what we know from the broad view of Jewish history, the cyclical upturns of polarization and demagoguery that we've lived through for, for millennia? Is there something uniquely troubling about this moment that your book would tend to? So there's a lot to unpack, I think, in the way that you laid out the question. So number one, like, I don't believe in cycles. Like, I have a background in economics, and so, you, you know, there are those people who would say, oh, there are kind of economic cycles. Like, I don't think so. Economics and the way that markets work are the result of human intervention. They don't happen on their own, right? They're not destined, like the seasons, to operate in a certain way, right? I think that's important. So the Jewish condition that we've seen over the last 2,000 some odd years, living in diaspora, where almost every situation has ended in persecution, uh, victimization, exile, or genocide. That is not like the natural order of things, it's the result of human intervention. Whether it's the crown, or the church, or the czar, or the caliph, or the fuhrer, or whatever, like, as these things have happened, it's not because it's deigned to be, it's because of man's inhumanity, right? So I think that's just important as background. And this place, like I am long on America, and I am someone who believes in American exceptionalism. I really do. Let's put Israel aside for a minute. This country, this democracy, has been better for the Jewish people than any in the history of modernity, I, I'm right? So, I'm so glad you say that because I often, even when things seem particularly dire, I remind my community all the time that we are the luckiest, most prosperous, most, uh, most accepted Jewish people who have ever lived in Jewish history. Entirely correct. And yes, like Australia, you know, uh, Canada, there's some other places that have been pretty good to their Jews, but none of them have a Jewish second gentleman. None of them have Jews who've succeeded in all quarters. And we've come so far. 
When ADL was founded 110 years ago, there were laws in this country that prevented Jews from buying homes in many places, that prevented Jews from attending universities in many parts of the country. Jews were culturally not allowed to work in many professions. Jews weren't treated at many medical institutions. We were just talking about this, you know, uh, Miri and myself, LA people, I spent a long time in LA, Cedar sinai the big hospital in Los Angeles, was founded by Jews because they couldn't get treatment at the other hospitals. I don't know if people realize that. Jewish doctors couldn't get hired, couldn't go to medical school anyways, and they couldn't get treated. Um, this is super important to keep in mind because there was what we would describe in like the current parlance as systemic discrimination against Jews. A hundred years later, literally, there are no such laws, there are no more such practices. You can get into any club. And Jews, they founded their own clubs, and they weren't committed, and they're better than the Gentiles' clubs. So this is all super germane. Now, we live with enormous privilege. And when you compare our situation and just the data to like what African Americans face, like the realities of systemic racism are real. And anyone who thinks that they aren't like doesn't know the numbers. Like it's undeniable if you just look at the data. All that being said, something is changing for Jews. Now start with the data. ADL has been monitoring anti-Semitic attitudes in this country since the 1960s. When we started doing this in 1964, about 30% of Americans had what we would call extensive anti-Semitic attitudes. That number dropped, 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 and has stayed between like 8 and 12% for almost two decades. When we did this, every two to three years we do these surveys. We did one in 2019, 11% of the population had extensive anti-Semitic attitudes. For us, that's pretty good and consistent with the historical trends. We ran the survey again last year. The number was 20%. That's a 30-year high, okay? 30-year high. ADL also collects information about incidents. We track acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence directed at the Jewish community. We've been doing this since the 1970s. Every incident we report, we investigate. So the data is really, if you'll excuse the term, kind of bulletproof. In 2022, ADL reported or recorded 3,697 anti-Semitic acts. That's the highest number we've ever seen in almost 45 years. That was a 36% increase over 2021. By the way, 2021 was the previous high water mark. In fact, three times in the last five years, the numbers have reached an all-time high. The number in 2022 was more than 500% greater than 10 years earlier. So, it's high here in the state of Washington. The numbers are never good here. But in places like New York, with the largest Jewish population in the country, the highest numbers we've ever seen, by far. So the data tells us attitudes are going in the wrong direction. Incidences are surging. And then anecdotally, I can tell you story after story. Last night, Ron DeSantis announced his um, kind of. <laughs> Couldn't happen to a nicer the, pair. The best Absolutely. description, kind of. And he talked about, among other things, if you could hear what he said, quote, global cabals. Yeah, I was going to get to that. A week before we know, or two weeks before, you know, uh, Elon Musk talked about uh, George Soros as, quote, destroying humanity. These invocations of, I mean, anti-Semitism itself is a kind of conspiracy theory, but the idea that like leading business people, leading political candidates, routinely and like unapologetically invoke anti-Semitic tropes should alarm you. And then I think some of you might know that there were going to be protesters for this event today. They didn't show up, or they didn't come, didn't kind of crystallize, thankfully. But they accuse ADL of being 
plotting behind the scenes to oppress Muslims and Palestinians and so on and so forth. The old puppet master trope. Puppet master, invoking the same kind of claims on the other side. So whether it's from the right or from the left, we are seeing the normalization of anti-Semitic anti tropes, the normalization of anti-Jewish myths that are damaging to all of us, regardless of how you vote. If you have simply values, shared values like decency, right, grace, humanity, these things now are changing in ways that, honestly, we haven't seen before. So yeah, uh, one of the things that's most heartbreaking to me is I remember, I, I don't know if you remember, 1984, Charles Silberman, the Jewish uh, sociologist, put out a book, A Certain People. And in it, he, he declared the end of anti-Semitism, if you remember. And it was the anti-Semitism of kind of the classic, yeah. you know, as you were saying, the denials of being in clubs and neighborhoods or what have you. One of the things that's most heartbreaking to me is the fact that I grew up with relatively little anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. But now my children are experiencing, particularly in academic settings or what have you, a degree of maybe different in kind, but, but similar in degree to what my grandparents and my parents experienced, which is amazingly heartbreaking to me. So I tend to, this is my bias, I tend to see an inflection point in 2016 with the, not that Trump caused these things, but I think he opened the Pandora's box and gave it an imprimatur of acceptability of all sorts of polarization, all sorts of discrimination that had been uh, marginalized previously. Why, why do, do you see a similar kind of inflection point and why are we having this kind of up, up to it now? So Rabbi, I think your read is right. So the data reflects this as well. So incidences which have been on the decline since 2001 started going in the wrong direction in 2016. And there's no question that Trump's, you know, look, Trump is a paradox. I mean, he literally has Jewish grandchildren, right? He had Jewish people around him his entire life. Um, but they're good with money. Pardon? They're good with money. Yeah, he likes to have lawyers wearing little caps. That's right, stuff. accountants having people, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, so it, it, he may say those things, but again, he has Jew, we've never had this, realized this. Before President, I mean, no president until Trump had such an intimate relation with the Jewish people. He had a, he has a Shomer Shabbos. How many of you have children who are Shomer Shabbos? <laughs> he does, literally. Now that being said, he also brought Steve Bannon to the White House. He also made white, he welcomed white supremacists into his like electoral coalition that year. And he had dinner he ran, with Kanye and Nick Fuentes. Well, that's later, but even just in 2016, yeah. Yeah. he ran ads that were explicitly, like mind-bendingly anti-Semitic. Um, and of course, find very fine people and telling the Proud Boys and Kanye and Nick and all the rest of them. So you've never had a president who was so personally connected to Jewish people. You never had a president who so welcomed the enemies of the Jewish people into the seat of power. He did that. And he ushered in a lot of this. Now, at the same time, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, Isaac Newton said. And so some of the stuff we've seen from like the far left yeah. is equally alarming. Now, to be clear, you know, the far left tends to be a lot less explosively violent than the far right. You know, Pittsburgh, Charlottesville, El Paso, Buffalo, like Charleston, I could go on. There are, there are numerous examples, lots of them, okay? The guy who tried to ram in the White House the other night, two nights ago, or Monday night. Now, look, he was of South Asian descent with a Nazi flag extolling the virtues of Adolf Hitler to the arresting officers. So white supremacy and far-right extremism is like a virus that infects people. The stuff on the left is absolutely less explosively violent. But like, again, I'm the thought, we were talking about this just a moment ago, I'm the dad of two college students. And the issues on campuses are crazy and real. And so, you know, I, the way I, I, I think about it is there's almost like two variants of this, of this virus. There's abrasive anti-Semitism that tears off the mezuzah on the college student's dorm that um, 
shoots, tries to do a mass casualty event in, at a synagogue in Poway, and on and on. But there's also then erasive anti-Semitism. Erasive anti-Semitism. And this is not including anti-Semitism in DEI programming. This is the mom who told me last night at a parlor meeting that I did here that their kid's private school, the school told them, we're not going to, we don't teach anti-Semitism. We're only focused on issues of racism and hate. Anti-Semitism isn't a problem. Like, that's what I would call erasive anti-Semitism. It's the chief HR officer and one of the largest employers in the United States who, when I asked her if they have a Jewish ERG, she just looked at me like, why would we have that? It, so it's, there's, there's both variants. They have different velocity. Like, one is, 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 one is slower moving. One is fast moving. One is violent. One is less. They're both troubling, and we need to have the kind of intellectual honesty and the clarity of vision to recognize both of them as problems. And can I say one, one last please, please, thing? Please, please, please. One last thing. As we were just talking about earlier today, we had a local board meeting. If you look back at the, most, the worst acts of anti-Semitism over the last year and a half, Colleyville, Texas, that was an individual who's, who was a... ISIS supporter. The assaults that happened around the Gaza conflict, those were hardened anti-Zionists. The stabbing of the rabbi in Muncie, New York, that was a person who'd been radicalized also by anti-Zionist content. The shooting at, at the kosher supermarket in Jersey City, those were two black Hebrew Israelites. Okay? The shooting in Poway, of course, was a white supremacist, Pittsburgh's white supremacist, and the assaults in Brooklyn that are happening almost last year, we had more than an assault every week in Brooklyn, New York. Those were anti-Semitism of no ideology. Those are like opportunist acts of violence where, where Jewish people, visibly Orthodox people, got punched, got kicked, got assaulted because they're Jews and they were easy targets for young people. So I'm laying all this out because anti-Semitism isn't something that we should reduce to the right or the left, or it's only about Israel, or it's only about you know, great uh, replacement theory. It happens from religious fanatics, from political extremists, from you know, mentally disturbed people, and it happens with, from those of no ideology well, Isn't this what makes anti-Semitism so insidious, is that it is a constantly mutating virus? You know, in a society in which the boogeymen, so to speak, are capitalist, Jews are capitalists. If they're communists, Jews are communists. If they're globalist, if they're cosmopolitan, it doesn't matter. They, whatever the, the label that is necessary to apply to Jews as the great threat within a society, it's going to mutate no matter what. The rabbi is entirely correct. I mean, look, anti-Semitism is indeed a conspiracy theory about how the world works that centers the problem on the Jews. And scapegoating, it's as old, scapegoating is as old as time. So in a world today where social media is how we get our news, and you know, QAnon and 9-11 you know, truthers and the anti-vaxxers and such, have, and the anti-Zionists have made conspiracy theories the coin of the realm, the oldest conspiracy theory of all has even more prominence. So I think that's totally right, and it's dangerous. I think the other thing is that we're living in a country today, I mean today for those who don't know, is the third anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, right, at the hands of police officers, right? I mean a, a despicable, horrendous, and entirely unnecessary act. Um, but evidence of this issue of systemic racism, particularly in law enforcement, okay? That being said, America often, and the news that mediates you know, the world in which we live, sort of reduces things into either left or right, red or blue, and also issues of race, black or white. But we as a Jewish people don't fit into that box. Are we people of color? Well, my wife certainly is, but I'm not. We're both Jews. We are a cross denomination. There are Jews who are Reform, who are Haredi, and who call themselves atheist. They're still Jews. They say they're culturally Jewish. 
We are a cross-denominational, multi-ethnic, multi-racial community. And so, again, in, in a world in which things seem to be re always reduced to some least common denominator, we don't fit neatly into those boxes, which makes it even more complicated. No, absolutely. And, and there have been a number of books about this, but the fact that Jews are perceived as part of the white supremacist structure by people on the extreme left and on the right, we are worse than people of color because we are the ones who are seeking to replace totally. yeah. good white people. I mean, so we're, we're never white enough for the white supremacists, and we're way too, too white, white. That's for right. the radical leftists. So we're. But, and that I think aligns with um, historical trends that Jews are always perceived as the outsider, no matter what the situation is historically. That's let right. me let me dig down a little deeper into something you said before. Just last week, you responded directly and incisively to the comments of Elon Musk that propagated the long-standing use of classic anti-Semitic tropes in demonizing George Soros. And this is a cancer that took root in the toxic discourse of Viktor Orban's fascist Hungary, yep. has found frequent and repeated currency amongst the Fo Fox News conspiracy and contrail crowd, yeah. and even has become part of the stump speech of supposedly mainstream presidential contenders. Why do you think this is happening more now? And why aren't more people able to identify this historical malignancy for what it is? Hmm. So let's start with what it is, okay? So as you said, I think very cogently, um, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory. And conspiracy theories often have some evil force you know, at the center of them. And the Jews have played this role, as you said, throughout history. Or like, the history of Western civilization in particular. Um, and yet at the same time, often certain people come to embody the Jews. So it was the Rothschilds in an earlier age. It was Sheldon Adelson in an earlier time in our political, recent political memory. Today it's George Soros. And George Soros is seen as the embodiment of evil. And he is certainly used by Viktor Orban and by Donald Trump and a lot of people in between as a stand-in for the Jews. Now, let me be clear. I don't agree with everything George Soros funds. I don't. He's a big supporter of some uh, NGOs in Israel that I really disagree with. He's a big supporter, he's a big proponent of the groups he funded of the Iran deal and of trying to normalize relations with the Islamic Republic. I'm firmly against that. He also was a major investor in building democracy in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. He and his investments and the universities he funded and the groups that he enabled are the reason why there was a peaceful transition. Like historians all say this, it's not my opinion per se. He's done a lot of good too. But we need to have the clarity of thought and the moral accountability to recognize, even if you don't like some things he says, when people traffic in these conspiracies, it fuels the fires of extremism. And this is not, again, Jonathan's or the rabbi's conjecture. You can look at the manifestos written by the shooters, some of the places I mentioned, Buffalo, El Paso, Pittsburgh, Poway, and Christchurch. They all mention George Soros. They all think he's trying to repay migrants to cross the border. He's not. Or trying to destroy borders across the world. He's not. I literally had a host on a network news show last week I did, two weeks ago, say to me off camera, he really does want a borderless world. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. But now, all that being said, I have spent time with Elon Musk. I talked to Elon Musk. I texted with him. I don't think he's an anti-Semite. I, I hate to say it because it sounds, well, you're going to hear it. Some of his best friends are Jews. <laughs> But that's actually true. Um, I don't think he's an anti-Semite, but you know what? It doesn't matter if he's still trafficking in these myths and he's promoting these ideas. And he doesn't make that connection. He doesn't. Just like Donald Trump doesn't make a decision. My daughter's Jewish. What do you think? I'm an anti-Semite. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do. Whether it's like, I can't intuit what's in Donald Trump's heart or Elon Musk's heart, but... I can judge people based on their actions. And those actions are very problematic. I told that to Elon last week, and he apologized publicly after I said that to him. Now, by the way, like I have the same problem with some of the anti-Zionists who make crazy claims of their own. Many of the anti-Zionists are Jewish. I'm sure there are people 
in this sanctuary who have children or friends who are Jews, who say, I'm anti maybe even Israelis, who say, I'm anti-Zionist. I got to tell you, though, again, they might not be anti-Semitic or think they're anti-Semitic themselves, but that doesn't take them off the hook if they're promoting anti-Semitic ideas. What it was that Van Jones said about Trump is that he may not be anti-Semitic, but anti-Semites think he's anti-Semitic. Like, I hadn't heard Van say that, but Van is a friend and so smart and so cogent, and that's exactly right. Like, it doesn't matter what is in Donald Trump's hearts. We know that he emboldened the extremists. How do we know that? Because at ADL, we track the extremists and they were saying in their private chat rooms, we feel emboldened, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and when he told them to stand back and stand by, his supporters said he didn't mean anything by it. The Proud Boys were like, yes, sir, ready, sir. And so we need to take, again, I don't know what's in his head or Elon's head or other people. I know Elon, and I've spent time with him, not like Trump. So again, I don't think he is in his heart, but it really doesn't matter what I think. I have to deal with what I know. And what I know is that, much like Trump thinking, I'm sorry, like Van saying about Trump, that he might not think he's anti-Semitic, but the extremists do, Elon might not think he's being anti-Semitic, but the extremists all see the signs. And if you have any doubt about this, by the way, for kicks, or maybe a degree of masochism, look at, look at Twitter and look at anything that I tweet. Like when I tweet about the color of the sky, the day of the week, <laughs> the stuff that people write is off the wall. And so that actually gets to why are we in this moment? Social media yeah. is a super spreader of this yes. stuff. Yes. It has amplified, it has intensified, it has spread this in ways that is what's made this moment different. So. Do I think it could happen here? It might not look like what happened to my wife's family 40 years ago or my grandfather's family, you know, 90 years ago. But you know what? Like, history doesn't, there's someone said this, not me. History doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Mm. And by the same way I was saying a few minutes ago that I don't believe in economic cycles. I don't. But I do believe that by the same token, there is no natural law that ordains that this will last forever. There is no, this isn't like, you know, a baseball game where you know how it's going to end, and if you lose at the end of the game, you can play the next day. Like, like this is the real world. And like a car, if you take your, your drive in the car, Tesla withstanding, <laughs> you take your hands off the wheel, the car goes off the road. I'm afraid that for too long we haven't had both hands on the wheels of our, the steering wheel of our democracy. And if we want this car to stay on the road and continue to enjoy the privileges we do here, we got to get in the game. Absolutely. So we're increasingly aware of what I like to call the horseshoe of hate. Yeah. How the extremes of left and right tend to bend toward one another to meet and agree on one thing, and that yeah. is contempt for the Jews, yeah. and by extension, the state of Israel. Yeah. You've gone so far as to assert that anti-Zionism is tantamount to anti-Semitism. And I would certainly agree that for many criticism of Israel that moves from legitimate concerns about government policy to a delegitimizing of the necessity of Israel's existence, that's the red line of distinction. Tell us a little bit more about anti-Semitism on the left and if there is any situation in which anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, even if it comes from Jews themselves. So anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, period. Double underline, exclamation point, or whatever punctuation mark you choose. So let me explain why I say that. So Zionism is the belief in the right of the Jewish people to self to political Zionism. Zionism itself, political Zionism, is the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in their ancestral homeland. It's Herzl's idea. It's 125 years old. That's what it is, as a response to the pogroms in Europe and realizing our ancient aspirations. Zionism, Zionism, is, if you will, 5,000 years old, or let's say 2,000 years old, since the expulsion 
of the Jews from Babylon, the Jews of, uh, by the Babylonians, and then again by the Romans. The Jews have always yearned to go back to their ancient homeland. Zionism, let me say this again, is 2,000 years old. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, you could pick up one of the Sidurim outside. You can open that up to, uh, tomorrow or on Saturday. Okay? Zionism is integral and essential to our Jewish identity. Anti-Zionism is not criticism of the state of Israel. It isn't. Anti-Zionism is the opposition of the Jews to the right of self-determination in their ancestral homeland. Anti-Zionism as a philosophy, as an ideology, is based on negating this basic right, this essential element of our Judaism. Again, it is not a philosophy of creation. This is not about like uh, pushing for a Palestinian state. Anti-Zionism is about the denial of this central element of our faith, of our identities. And yes, that is anti-Semitism. Now again, for the Palestinian person who was displaced in 1948, they may have very strong, very strong views about the state of Israel. But if they are dedicated to its destruction, let me tell you, that's anti-Semitic. Not to rising up a Palestinian state, but to destroying the Jewish one, that's anti-Semitic to the Jewish activist at the University of Seattle, who is really enraged about the way the Israelis are treating the, their own Arab citizens or whatever. I'm not even gonna get into the facts of that, okay? But even if they are Jewish and they're committed to destroying the Jewish state, that is anti-Semitic. It's not up to, for me or you or any of you to intuit what's in that person's heart. Like Elon Musk, they may say, well, I, some of my best friends are Jewish. I'm Jewish. Doesn't matter. Because the results of what they do promote anti-Semitism by dint of their impact, even if it's not their intention. But again, I want to say this one more time so it's crystal clear. Zionism is essential to our Jewish identity. And political Zionism is why we have the state of Israel today. Those who would deny Zionism or reject it, are rejecting that what makes us Jewish. And I think that's profoundly dangerous and wrong. Now let me say one other thing. I have very strong feelings about the way the government in Beijing treats its Muslim population in the western region of the country, the way they treat their Tibetan population also in the west, the way they treat democracy protesters in Hong Kong, the way they handled COVID-19, the way they administer surveillance state, the way they saber rattle against Taiwan, and so on, and so on, and so on. Does that mean I believe we should destroy the People's Republic of China? Are you crazy? Does that mean I think it should be open season on Chinese Americans? Like, are you nuts? Does that mean I think it's okay to spray paint the Uyghurs will be free in front of a Chinese restaurant or a Chinese church like on Capitol Hill? Are you out of your mind? Does any of you think, is there anyone who would imagine that that would be okay? Does anybody, can you tell me a world in which anyone thinks it would be appropriate to interrogate a student of Chinese heritage about their position on Beijing's treatment of the Uyghurs before letting them run for the student senate? I mean, these ideas are so preposterous, I feel almost silly saying them out loud. But that's what we're dealing with as Jews. That's what we're seeing as Jews. And it's wrong. So again, I don't have any problem with people criticizing the Israeli government for the proposed judicial reform. I've criticized them for that. For the way they treat um, African refugees, I've criticized them for that. For needing to push harder to create peace with the Palestinians, I've criticized them for that. But anti-Zionism, denying this most basic element of our faith and denying the reality of a state of nine million people is anti-Semitic every day of the week. 
no matter who's saying it and what they think their intentions are. Thank you. Um, I've buried the lead long enough. Let's talk about the lead. Literally, <laughs> as you were having coffee in a car coming here this morning, the White House released its yeah. uh, strategic policy paper on anti-Semitism. Um, I want to hear about just, I don't know if you've got a chance to read all 25 pages yeah. in the last five, you know, two hours or yeah. whatever, but one key element I want to talk about, because it's an element that was a source of controversy here, and that was using as a point of reference for a definition the IHRA, which is something that um, uh, we had some tumult here within the Jewish community. Oh, really? When the King County Council wanted to basically release an anodyne proclamation against anti-Semitism, they wanted to reference IHRA because so many other civic organizations have done so. It, it led to I'll a- I'll explain it. It led the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. And part of the controversy is that it does mention that certain uh, uh, delegitimization, uh, uh, you can quote it, that certain delegitimization of Israel is defined as anti-Semitism. It also says that there is legitimate criticism of Israel if you apply to Israel the same standards that you apply to any other nation that you are criticizing. The IHRA definition did make it in as a point of reference to the White House's statement today. It is a source of controversy. Why, talk a little bit about the statement more broadly and more specifically about why IHRA is a necessary point of reference for a definition of anti-Semitism. Okay, so super good question and clearly very timely. Um, let me just give a teeny bit of context. So the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance is an NGO out of Europe, formed a long time ago, and about 10, 12 years ago, give or take, they embarked upon a process to define anti-Semitism. They assembled scholars and researchers and policymakers in Europe to put together, develop a definition. So we could say, well, what is it? Because as we were saying a few minutes ago, it doesn't fit neatly into some other boxes like some other forms of hate. So this group developed a nonpartisan, nonpolitical definition, and they laid out a series of examples. The examples they laid out, including de delegitimization of Israel, are all conditional. They're all conditional. So it's not like some algebraic proof where there's a certain answer. They're all conditional. So we should say that right up front. So you have to interpret things as they are, right? And these, the, the definition is essentially a framework. Now, what's happened in the years since is dozens of governments have adopted the IRA definition. Dozens of scores of states in America and other like provinces and cities around the world have adopted the definition, as well as lots of non-governmental entities, businesses, sports teams, cultural organizations, et cetera. In recent years, um, Essentially, anti-Israel actors have organized and said the IRA definition impinges upon free speech because it says criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. That's not what it says. It just isn't. Like, that's literally not what it says. Period. Nonetheless, this has created some tumult from some quarters within our own community who want to be responsive because they're concerned about issues related to Israel. I really think this is a tempest in a teapot. The IRA definition is non-political. It leaves plenty of room for criticism of Israel. And when I ask people when they say to me, I say, well, help me understand. Can you give me an example where someone's free speech was, was minimized because of the IRA definition? Can you, can you give me an example that I can work with? Show me where someone's free speech was constrained. No one, at least to date, has been able to answer that question for me. Because there are no examples of it. There just aren't. All that being said, today the White House released this strategy. It's historic. This isn't like a statement after a tragedy. This is in advance of an incident. The president deputized his, uh, the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, who I know was here in town recently, as well as uh, Susan Rice, his domestic policy advisor, to come up with a plan. And they engaged the whole executive branch. Including Deborah Lipstadt, who has spoken here a number of times. Who's a terrific person. 
an amazing scholar. I believe that as an academic, she was part of the IRA committee, by the yeah. way. I think that's right. Um, anyways, so they released this plan today after like almost six months of work. It's got 100 recommendations. Never had something like this from the federal government before. Um, all the concrete things that they say the executive branch will do, and they're broad. Like USDA is going to do more to ensure there are kosher food for Jewish you know, students for, in terms of school lunches. Um, DOJ, the Department of Justice committed to make sure that hate crimes are more effectively reported, et cetera, et cetera. It's really good. And all the steps that the White House say the executive branch will take, they're concrete and there are deadlines all within the next 12 months. It's great. They also call on Congress to do certain things and businesses and civil society. So it's comprehensive, it's concrete, and it's really historic. ADL has been very involved behind the scenes. They cite a lot of our data. It's very pleased about that. And a lot of our recommendations made it in. Now, there was some controversy about would it embrace the IRA definition of anti-Semitism as the rabbi was laying out. So previous to the strategy, the State Department and the US Department of Education had already embraced IRA, meaning they were using it, which is good. Um, I have not read the report. Like you said, it came out at you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I've been, I just haven't read it yet. Maybe it came out at 8.30 or something, <laughs> but like, it just happened. Um, if 8 o'clock, you, you should have read I it. I know. What were you doing? Exactly, exactly. Um, I was playing Wordle. <laughs> I got it in four today. It's a very Jewish word today, by the way. I haven't done it yet. Oh. You give me a hint. That's good. That's you good. have a hint. Good, good. good. What? <laughs> okay, so, um, but it's ironic that there'd be a little bit of Yiddishkeit in the Wordle on the day they released the strategy. Ah, yes. I wonder if the nice. Jews are behind that. Exactly. Um, Please. Soros. That's an, that's an anti-Semite's dream. Are you kidding? Exactly. Exactly. Aha! <laughs> um, no. Uh, so, but what I do understand from my staff who have read it um, is that it, and I talked to the White House yesterday and I talked to Deborah this morning, that the plan clearly enshrines IRA as the sole definition that the US government is using to understand the problem of anti-Semitism. It, it mentions the fact that there are other definitions, but the one that it elevates and the one that it enshrines is this IRA definition. That is, I think, a win. It advances the field, because before it was education and state, now it's the entire US government. That's a victory for those of us who want anti-Semitism in all its forms you know, to be an area of focus. One of the concerns you hear from the other side is that um, I think it's, it's not substantive. It's guilt by association. It's become a talisman because it was utilized by the Trump administration for a Title VI uh, 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 statement about education that probably was the intent of it was to try to chill free speech on campus, whether it actually does so or not. So that's part of the problem is, I think, not the substance of IRA, but rather the fact that it was utilized by people that we hold in contempt. Look, so I think that that is, once again, a very good read. Um, again, back to where what we were talking about earlier, things have become so riven with partisanship in ways that are very unhelpful. So Rabbi was speaking about an executive order issued by President Trump in 2019 to tackle anti-Semitism on college campuses. To date, up until that point, at the Department of Education, there's an Office of Civil Rights. The Office of Civil Rights handles civil rights complaints and in launches investigations into the way colleges and universities, accredited institutions, are dealing with these issues. Until that point in 2019, the Office of Civil Rights U.S. Department of Education had not taken a single case of anti-Semitism. The number would exactly be zero. There were many cases brought or filed. They dismissed all of them. I think that's probably a mistake. Like just statistically speaking, I think it's hard to imagine with the, I don't know exactly how many, but like scores of these things had been filed and not one of them had been recognized. So the Trump EO was attempting to correct that. And look, in case you weren't paying attention, I'm not exactly a fan of President Trump, 
But that doesn't preclude me from saying he may have done some things that were right. That EO was right. And trying to get the Department of Education to take the issues on college campuses seriously was the right thing to do. And the fact that that EO embraced IRA, you're probably also correct that that immediately meant for some people on the left, oh, that means IRA's bad. And like, that's a shame. Like, I can recognize, like, I can recognize that while there's a lot I didn't like about President Trump and his policies, there were some things he did that were right. Just like I can say there's some things about President Biden that I don't like, but there's a lot that I do. So I, I, I just think when we are so reductive and oversimplify everything, as if we, like we as Jews, like here's something I hope you'll all take away from this talk. Jews can't afford to play for the red team or the blue team. If we believe that there's only one team that we can play for, we've already lost the game. We have got to recognize the complexity and the nuance. And there may be things that we agree with over here and disagree, and things we agree with over here and disagree. And if we don't entertain, I mean, look, like this is our tradition. Our tradition is one of dissent. Our Talmudic tradition is one of recognizing that we can comment, even on a commentary, that there is no right answer. And I, I think it's a shame when we forget those timeless lessons that are so integral to our tradition. The team for Jews is liberal democracy here, across here. the board. Um, so then that's, that's really the bottom line. I couldn't agree Just, more. That Jews flourish where liberal democracy is on the rise, and we suffer where it is being diminished. So this annual event brings together clergy and lay leaders from around the region to hear renowned speakers. And while I build this day as, um, uh, for, for outside the Jewish community as how they can become good allies, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the word ally. I think it connotes a sense of, of kind of comrades in arms. I'd rather create friendships. I'd rather Bravo. we find friends, not allies. How can those who are gathered today truly act as friends to the Jewish community at a time in which all of us, especially those in marginalized communities, are calling upon one another to stand shoulder to shoulder against the darkness that seems to be encroaching us? So how can we all be better friends? Well, I think the way that our non-Jewish uh, neighbors can be better friends to the Jewish community, I think, number one, it starts by showing up without judgment, without preconditions, show up. And then stick around. Sticking around really matters. Sometimes there's something performative in showing up, right? Sticking around is harder. After the cameras are gone, after the lights are down, sticking around means being present and listening and learning from your Jewish friends. We got a lot to learn from other people too, to be clear, this needs to be a mutual process. But I think the best way we can be better friends to one another is showing up and sticking around because that implies listening in an earnest, authentic way, being open to learning and challenging your own preconceptions. Um, and again, approaching one another as fellow human beings. And I think, oh, you're the rabbi, not me, but what's that? adage about the rabbi, I think it was Hillel, was it Hillel, who got asked by, I don't know, whatever terrible person in Jewish history, maybe it was during the Inquisition. Teach me all of Judaism while I stand on one foot. And he said? And he said, do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. All the rest is commentary, go study. Right. So like, there you go. So if we can just all remember that adage of doing unto others, you know, listening, learning, and being there, that, that's, how we, that's how we win. So we have 10 minutes before you have to get on Wolf Blitzer while we eat lunch. Okay. But a um, couple quick questions. Yeah. I say that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's something I say every day. Um, this is something that I, I hear all the time, and, and I, I know how to respond to it, but I'd rather hear your response. Sure. How do you compare anti-Semitism today in the U.S. with the 1930s? It's, it's different. I mean, the truth is, again, in the 1930s in America, the 1930s in Germany, the Nuremberg Laws, you know, led to the situation, led to the, you know, the Shoah. The 1930s in America, Father Coughlin was on the radio every night. There were Nazis in Madison Square Garden. There were laws that, again, prevented us from participating in public life like other Americans. 
none of that's true. I mean, I say none of that's true today. Dr. Carlson is a bit like Father Coughlin. Twitter is a bit like Madison Square Garden. But, but the truth is, is that we live with so much privilege and we've succeeded in so many ways. But I mean, you know, I'll tell you a story. La it was last year, whenever it was, uh, the editor of a big newspaper, a Jewish newspaper, called me and she says, what had just happened? Maybe Kyrie had just happened or Kanye or whatever. She says, Jonathan, I don't know what to write about. I wrote about anti-Semitism. Is there really anything left to say? And I said to her, well, you know what? That reminds me, just before you called, I got a call from the frog who said, yeah, sure, the water is warm today, a little warmer than yesterday, but I'm sure it will be better tomorrow. Do I have anything to worry about? And she was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's true. Like, again, it's so much better today. Liberal democracy is strong in lots of ways, but we have to keep both hands on the wheel, and we can't afford to take this for granted. This question aligns with another one I was going to ask real quickly. The tendencies of hate are as old as human civilization, but they've been, as you mentioned, exponentially amplified by what you call in your, bo your, your book, the hate boosters on social media. And while ADL has been tracking this for decades, just recently, mm -hmm. the renowned social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who also has spoken here before, oh, great. has added to our anxiety in the recent Atlantic article yeah. where he said AI is going ratchet to this, ratchet this up to unprecedented and unimaginable levels. So contend for the Nobel Peace Prize by sharing how you think we should confront this metastasizing monster and what ADL is already doing to track this and to offer some, some strategies against digital hate. So ADL launched, look, again, as you mentioned in your bio, man, I worked in Silicon Valley for a long time, and I was blessed to have some success. I'm an incubated venture at Google. I mean, I really know the industry and have a lot of friends still there. Um, again, social media has been this super spreader, but like AI is, is, is game changing. And so we're deeply worried about it. We opened a center in Silicon Valley in 2017. I think we're the only Jewish group, I think we were the first civil rights group to have staff in the Valley. And I hired a former product manager from Reddit to run it. Now I have a Facebook, a former Facebook executive running our center. So we're doing research. It starts, I mean, our approach is very data-driven. So we now do annual surveys of online hate and harassment to get baselines and look at what communities are being affected for what it's worth. AAPIs, Asian American Pacific Islanders, and LGBTQ people are far more targeted and victimized online than Jewish people, just so you know. That's what the data tells us. So we're doing that, number one. Number two, we're driving for policy change. I think ultimately we need government to engage here. The businesses have shown us that they're incapable of doing it themselves. Self-regulation doesn't work. And then number three, you know, we're trying to come up with innovative ways to get this into the public conversation. So in addition to the lobbying, in addition to the research, we are doing reports, we're creating initiatives. I think generative, social media is so problematic because it's what we see on our phone, right, in the news that we get. But generative artificial intelligence, it's like when you're not looking at your phone. It's everything around us. I mean, imagine a world in which Again, not just what you read, but the services that are offered to you or the products that, are, that you see when you open up your phone or go to the store, the policies are being dictated by invisible algorithms that have a kind of sentience to them that thinks that Jews are just bad. Like, that could happen. And I, you know, here's what I would say. To make this relatable, Chat GPT, have you all seen Chat GPT? Raise your hands if you've seen it or used it. Chat GPT in 2023 is what Netscape was in 1994. So again, I want to just put that in some context where we are right now. Amazon didn't exist. Microsoft was a desktop software company, really. Okay? Um, Zillow. Couldn't, you couldn't even imagine it existing. So I'm just thinking about Seattle businesses. How many of you go, don't order Starbucks off your app, right? I mean, the, some of you. So the reality is, is that 30 years ago, we couldn't imagine a world where Amazon and Uber and Zillow have reinvented, Airbnb have reinvented the way we live, PayPal, everything. 
Like the whole economy has been transformed by social media. Chat GPT will do the same. More quickly. Way more quickly. So it took 30 years or so since then to, live, to be where we are today. I think you know, our generative artificial intelligence will do it in like 10 years probably. Again, there'll be entirely new global corporations you don't know. There'll be entirely new creations, products, wild environments you can't imagine. And so if we don't get global attention on this now, we're gonna lose. Like, that's the, the, I don't know where it will go, but I can predict if there isn't global collaboration between Europe and the US and China, we will lose. If we let the tech get ahead of the ethics and the regulation, it's gonna be bad for the world, but also bad for the Jews. It's always bad for the Jews. It's always bad for the Jews. All right, Wolf's waiting. Um, we're gonna end this part. Please give him a round of applause, Thank please, you. for a wonderful conversation. You are invited to come together, have some food, talk about the things that we've been talking about, and after his interview in about an hour or so, he's gonna come back, we're gonna do some wrap up and some more questions, and kind of bring the, uh, the morning to a close. Thank you very much, we'll see you out there.